Welcome again to our third lecture on stylistics. The theme of this lecture is Stylistic classification of the English vocabulary, special literary vocabulary. This lecture is designed specially for the students of the Department of English and German Languages who study for the specialty foreign language to foreign languages. Within this lecture, we will discuss the following points. The first is about the general considerations on stylistic classification of the English vocabulary. And the second large point will be about the special literary vocabulary. But in today's lecture, we will consider only two groups in the large group of the special literary vocabulary, namely poetic words and archaic words. Let's pass to our first point. Stylistic classification of the English vocabulary. Like any linguistic issue, the classification of a vocabulary suggested here is for purely stylistic purposes. A discussion of the ways the English vocabulary can be classified from the stylistic point of view should be given proper attention. In order to get a more or less clear idea of the word stock of any language, it must be presented as a system, the elements of which are interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent. The word stock of a language may be represented as a definite system in which different aspects of words may be singled out as interdependent. A special branch of linguistic science, lexicology, has done much to classify vocabulary. For our purpose, that is, for linguistic stylistics, a special type of classification the so-called stylistic classification, is most important. In accordance with the division of language into literary and colloquial, we may represent the whole of the word stock of the English language as being divided into three main layers, the literary layer, the neutral layer, and the colloquial layer. The literary and the colloquial layers contain a number of subgroups, each of which has a property it shares with all the subgroups within the layer. This common property, which unites the different groups of words within the layer, may be called its aspect. The aspect of the literary layer is its markedly bookish character. It is this that makes the layer more or less stable. The aspect of the colloquial layer of words is its lively spoken character. It is this that makes it unstable, fleeting. You can see here the three large circles. Neutral words, special literary vocabulary and special colloquial vocabulary. The aspect of the neutral layer is its universal character. That means it is unrestricted in its use. It can be employed in all styles of language and in all spheres of human activity. It is this that makes the layer the most stable of all. The literal layer of words consists of groups accepted as legitimate members of the English vocabulary. They have no local or dialectal character. The colloquial layer of words, as qualified in most English or American dictionaries, is not infrequently limited to a definite language community or confined to a special locality where it circulates. 
Now let's look at the subgroups within each layer. The literary vocabulary consists of the following groups of words. Common literary, terms and learned words, poetic words, archaic words, barbarisms and foreign words, literary coinages, including nonce words. The colloquial vocabulary falls into the following groups. Common colloquial words, slang, jargonisms, professional words, dialectal words, vulgar words, and colloquial coinages. The common literary neutral and common colloquial words are grouped under the term standard English vocabulary. Other groups in the literary layer are regarded as special literary vocabulary, and those in the colloquial layer are regarded as special colloquial, non-literary vocabulary. You can see all these groups and subgroups within this group on this diagram. Neutral words which form the bulk of the English vocabulary, are used in both literary and colloquial language. Neutral words are the main source of synonymy and polysemy. It is the neutral stock of words that is so prolific in the production of new meanings. The wealth of, of the neutral stratum of words is often overlooked. This is due to their inconspicuous character, but their faculty for assuming new meanings and generating new stylistic variants is often quite amazing. This generative power of the neutral words in the English language is multiplied by the very nature of the language itself. It has been estimated that most neutral English words are of monosyllabic character. As in the process of development from Old English to Modern English, most of the parts of speech lost their distinguishing suffixes. This phenomenon has led to the development of conversion as the most productive means of word building. Now we'll speak about the special literary vocabulary. And the first group we are going to discuss is poetic words. Learned words are mainly associated with the printed page, and therefore we may think that they cannot be used in everyday speech. But in fact, this is an erroneous attitude, because any educated person is sure to use many learned words not only in his formal letters, such as legal documents or scientific articles, and professional communication, for instance, during lectures, but also in his everyday speech. Educated people both in fiction and in real life use learned words quite naturally. But of course, excessive use of learned elements, both in prose and in real life, might sound ridiculous. Utterances overloaded with pompous words usually tend to be pretentious, and their users claim that they are far too refined to use neutral vocabulary. But instead of refinement and elegance, they achieve the exact opposite. They look absurd and ridiculous. Though, if we didn't know some learned words, it would be impossible to deal with official documents or even read fiction. Moreover, you would not be able to listen to lectures of stylistics, which are delivered in English.
the words which are usually called literary words are described as refined. And the most interesting subdivision of learned words is represented by the words found in fiction. They usually stand close to the previous group, that is learned words, but at the same time, poetic words have their own peculiarities. They are lofty, high-flown coloring. Have a look at this example taken from the work A Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Summer followed summer, and yellow jonquils bloomed and died many times, and nights of horror repeated the story of their shame, but he was unchanged. No winter marred his face or stained his flower-like blue. The poetic words used here are really lofty, high-flown coloring. Poetic words are mostly archaic words aiming to produce an elevated effect. Words create mood and context, and for this purpose, old-sounding, old-fashioned, or obsolete words have often been employed. The literary trend of Romanticism and symbolism was rich in fresh poetic terms. Of course, not all English poetry makes use of poeticisms. It is considered that poetical words make the utterance understandable only to a number of readers. Sometimes such words hinder understanding and force the reader to stop and try to decipher the message as encoded. For example, wings of because, goldenly whole, purchasely king star, whom she and he, like ifs of M, Receive. All these combinations are considered ungrammatically in as much as they violate the rules of encoding a message. Modern poets, particularly modernist and postmodernist poets, have a strong bias for all kinds of innovation. They are ready to approve of any deviation from the normal. This kind of avant-garde movement in art is characterized by the use of unorthodox and experimental methods. Sometimes such methods lead to extremes. And the second group within the special literary vocabulary layer is archaic group, archaic words. Archaic words are primarily used in the creation of a realistic background to historical novels. Here they maintain the function of creating the atmosphere of the past. The reader, as it were, lives in the epoch presented by the author and therefore perceives the use of archaic words as a natural mode of communication. For instance, Walter Scott is a master in the creation of a historical atmosphere. He does it so skillfully that the reader is scarcely aware that the heroes of the novel speak his language and not their own epoch. For this purpose, he uses language which is not out of date, but at the same time avoids using words and phrases of modern coinage. He sparingly introduces into the texture of his language a few words and expressions more or less obsolescent in character. Mostly, he introduces variety of historical terms. Archaic words and phrases are very seldom, if ever, found in the style of official documents, 
business letters, legal language, diplomatic documents, etc. Though there are some obsolescent words which may be preserved within the style of official documents. For instance, aforesaid, hereby, therewith. The function of these words is terminological in character. It is also possible that archaic words were used for satirical purposes. It is when the situation in which the archaism is used is not appropriate to the context. It also happens that an archaic word may undergo a sudden revival and be re-established in the vocabulary. For instance, the formerly archaic word kin, which means relatives, one's family, is now current in American usage. The same is true of the word albeit, the meaning of which is although. There remains also the problem of differentiating the three terms, archaic, obsolescent, and obsolete. And now we'll speak about each of these types of archaic words. Obsolescent words are called such words which are in the stage of gradually passing out of general use. The beginning of the aging process when the word becomes rarely used. To this category, first of all, belong morphological forms belonging to the earlier stages in the development of the language. In the English language, these are the pronouns though and its forms the, thy, and thine. The corresponding verbal ending est and the verb forms art, wilt. To the category of obsolescent words belong many French borrowings which have been kept in the literary language as a means of preserving the spirit of earlier periods. For example, a palette, a straw, garniture instead of furniture, etc. Obsolete words are those that have already gone completely out of use because are still recognized by the English-speaking community. For example, methinks, it seems to me, nay instead of no. The third group is called archaic proper. These words are no longer recognizable in modern English. Words that were in use in Old English and which have either dropped out of the language entirely or have changed in their appearance so that they have become unrecognizable. The borderline between archaic and obsolete words is vague and uncertain, and in many cases it is difficult to decide to which of the groups this or that word belongs. So this is all in brief concerning our uh, lecture, and these are the comprehension questions which will help you to check your understanding of the content of the lecture. This is the list of the sources with, which can be used for further reading. Thank you for your attention.